Hello everyone, I am happy to welcome you to yet another session of the course, The History of English Language and Literature. Journeying through the different phases of British Romanticism, today we begin to look at the later revolutionary period which was characterized by a different kind of Romanticism that was very different from the ones dominated by poets such as Wordsworth and Coleridge. We noted in the beginning how the French Revolution was an impetus in uh, in triggering a lot of ideal and revolutionary reactions in terms of uh, the newer forms of literature. And we also notice how all of these poets and writers and thinkers who lived during their time were initially very fascinated by the French Revolution, but once the revolution took a bloody turn of events, they were also disappointed with the many ideas that also uh, had uh, uh, that also had influenced the revolution in the first place. In today's session, focusing our attention to the later revolutionary age, we notice right at the outset that the French revolution had come to an end. But however, the revolutionary movement either in politics or in literature, it had not really come to an end. It, in that sense, this session is a continuation of the revolutionary ideals which began to inspire a generation of poets and uh, writers in the, uh, from the end of the 18th century onwards. So, there is no particular date which could be given as the inaugural moment of this later revolutionary uh, age, but however, it would be safe to assume that this is a set of poets and writers and thinkers who were influenced by the uh, remnants of these ideas, particularly in the 19th century. Even after the revolution uh, which happened in France, there continue to be repeated disturbances in Spain, Portugal, Greece. Italy and also in England. So, what will happen in England and continue to happen in England is the source of interest in our present lecture. In England, we noted in the previous session that as soon as the revolution in France took a bloody turn and also uh, it was dominated by a reign of terror, we also noticed that many of the supporters of the early stage of revolution, they began to turn away. And a very strong conservative reaction replaced the earlier romantic and revolutionary ideas which were propelling many of the romantic uh, uh, ideals of the poetry and literature. So, the older generation including Wordsworth and Coleridge as we noticed earlier, they began to abandon the earlier faith they had in these standards of revolution and they also in, in certain way affected the ways in which the principles of uh, progress and popular government were also getting popular. So, we begin to see that a certain kind of complacency of Toryism had begun to dominate the general socio-political scene in England. But this was not at all acceptable to the younger generation which grew up hearing a lot about the uh, wonderful era of revolution. So, uh, though they, they were born into the era of revolution, when they were growing up they did not see much signs of this revolution getting manifested in, uh, in England because most of the older generation were already disillusioned with the ideals of the revolution. So, the younger generation who were growing up in 19th century England, they found themselves in a world which had emerged from the long strain of a revolutionary excitement, exhausted but not satisfied. So, the triggering phase of this later revolutionary age may be identified in this set of emotions which were not yet satisfied within England. In some sense, we can even state that the later revolutionary age was dominated by a set of feelings and a set of uh, priorities which were moving against apathy, indifference, cynicism, disappointment and aimless unrest. So, in this lecture, we uh, try to identify three major figures who respond to this situation and also were heavily influenced by this uh, period in, in though in varied ways. It is Byron, Keats and Shelley. And at the outset, it is important to reiterate a point that we had come to uh, come to take a look at even in, the, in one of the earlier sessions, that Romanticism as a general revolutionary uh, a movement and as a general revolutionary tendency in the writing of uh, poetry and in the production of literature in general, it did not have a singular kind of effect on all the writers. So, we noticed it even in the earlier phase when the writers were showing different kinds of responses and were giving different literary outputs. Uh, though the uh, triggering factor remained uh, almost similar. In the same way, even in the later revolutionary age, we notice that all these three figures which are clubbed together uh, as the younger poets of the later revolutionary age, they have very little in common and they also responded in very different ways to this uh, the uh, English romanticism of the later phase. So, the younger poets of the romantic age include George Gordon, Lord Byron, Percy Bysshe Shelley, and John Keats. We begin our discussion by looking at one particular figure who has been generally discussed in history as a very fascinating figure and he was also considered as someone who was associated with a particular kind of male personality 
the brooding handsome hero. It was an unusual kind of mass cultural iconization of a literary personality. He was the largest selling poet in the first decades of the 19th century. He produced some energetic if uneven poetry. So no extra points for guessing who this extremely fascinating poet was. So we begin our discussion with Lord Byron who lived from 1788 till 1824. Byron is considered as the oldest of this younger generation of poets and he was also the most thoroughly representative poet of the later romantic phase and it's said that he also very fruitfully and the most effectively expressed the spirit of rebellion which was dominant in this later phase. He is considered by many historians and critics as the mouthpiece of this age and his own temperament was uh, quite stormy and quite volcanic and violent in nature. It said that it also led him to uh, a lot of uh, repeated conflicts with both uh, people and also with things. So we find him violently responding to many things which unsettled him and we also find that that remained the hallmark of the kind of writings that he produced. One of his first poetic output was the work uh, titled Hours of Idleness. It was published when he was very young but uh, it, also led, it also resulted in a lot of ferocious attacks by reviewers from the Edinburgh Review. But uh, Byron was not the kind who could take it lying down. He also wrote a very vigorous and a scathing satirical response to this review that appeared in the Edinburgh Review. Byron's uh, response titled The English Bards and Scotch Reviewers was published in 1809. And he was so daring and quite bold in uh, going against the grain of uh, the dominant tenets of literary principles, so much so that he even dared to lampoon Wordsworth and Coleridge and dismiss them equally as the scribbling crew. So this was in fact the first time that Byron began to be noticed in the London circles for being a very iconoclastic and a very unconventional kind of person. And he also repeatedly reiterated this right to uh, write whatever he feels in many different contexts and one of his first articulations could be found in one of his poems where he wrote right at the outset, I shall publish, right or wrong, fools are my theme, let satire be my song. So this in many ways reinforced Byron's role and reputation as an iconoclast both as a literary figure and, and also in terms of his personality. And the work which in many ways uh, cemented his reputation as a, a very well known literary uh, artist was the publication of Child Harold's Pilgrimage. The first two cantos of Child Harold was published in 1812. This work was based on a tour that he undertook throughout the continent in, from 1809 to 1811. The two years that he had spent touring the co continent uh, gave him a lot of uh, experiences, a lot of memories and all of those found its way to an artistic expression as well. So we find a very uh, uh, fascinating description of places, historic memories and also a lot of melancholic meditation. This work was an immediate uh, success. It was. Uh, it also received a lot of extravagant adulation. It, it also forced Byron to acknowledge at a later point that after the success of this work, I woke up one morning and found myself famous. So this was the kind of instant gratification that this work gave him in terms of his literary reputation. He also went on to publish a number of romances in verse and uh, however in between his work was all his uh, life was also fraught with a lot of other troubles in 1815 he gets uh, married and it was uh, also followed by a, a separation in 1816 but uh, needless to say given the conservative frame of mind that the society was placed in during the 19th century immediately a scandal broke out and he was denounced as a monster of iniquity and uh, important to recall that even at the, that point of time, soon after the success that he enjoyed from uh, with the success of uh, Child Harold, we find the society, the same society in fact denouncing him uh, for the kind of uh, personal uh, turns that events were taking place in his own life. So to, due to these difficulties, we find him leaving England as an embittered man and remaining life he was forced to spend in the continent. So during this time he also published some of the finest work continued to be uh, much anthologized even in the contemporary and one of the, the classic uh, products of those times include the short poem which begins which has the same title She Walks in Beauty. So this work is considered as one of the most important works by Byron. It continues to be oft quoted and also uh, much taught and much anthologized worldwide. So if you allow me to read uh, some bit of an introductory lines from this. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more, one ray the less had half impaired the nameless grace 
which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens o'er her face where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure how dear their dwelling place well this was only a phase of byron's productivity he was more reputed for the other wild iconoclastic things that he continued to write some of his more famous works include manfred cain the third and fourth cantos of child harold and an unfinished part of don juan in cain he engages with the terrific indictment of god's dealings with men but don juan was considered as one of his most successful works ever and also the work that cemented his reputation as an iconoclast and also as a master literary genius don juan is a satire upon the conventions and hypocrisies of society it's also considered semi autobiographical in nature it's also most famous for its opening line which states i need a hero so it said that it was byron's own longing to identify a hero whom he could emulate during those troubled times He was also quite famous for the many mocking mentions of Robert Southey in Don Juan. If you recall, Byron had already parodied a work by Robert Southey, The Vision of Judgment, in which he eulogized quite unrationally the uh, doings of King George the Third. So, in 1822, first time we find Byron mocking Southey uh, satirically in his works, and he continued to do that in many of his works. In fact, incidentally, though Robert Southey was a poet laureate, much of his fame now rests in the many mansions that he found mockingly in uh, Byron's works. We do find Byron enjoying a lot of success even during his lifetime, but however in the end we find him becoming weary of almost everything of fame, of poetry and even of himself. And we find him looking for a very new kind of a new different kind of excitement uh, at at every phase in his life and eventually towards the end of his life which was pretty early as well, we find him throwing himself into the cause of Greece and he or even participates in the struggle for freedom which the uh, Greeks had launched against uh, the Turks and this also uh, is an extension of his uh, interest in the non-european cultures and histories if you uh, if it's useful to remember that some of his works such as the gaia the bride of abydus the siege of coring and the corsa all had uh, relied heavily on non-european cultures traditions and uh, mythology so eventually in 1824 he dies of a fever before his 37th birthday and he was also not in england he was uh, in greece when uh, this happened throughout his lifetime both in his writing career and also in his personal dealings we find byron idealizing all who were in revolt against the society in that sense we could identify in him a great interpreter of a revolutionary kind of iconoclasm and uh, this was a quite a popular thing during that time in 19th century england that byronic hero became almost a literary fashion Byron's heroes were very interesting and they were very unconventional and they also did the kind of things that heroes were usually not supposed to do. So his uh, his heroes were pirates, corsairs, outlaws and even the Ishmaels of the world. And his definition of liberty was of a very different kind. He identified liberty in pure individualism. So we do find him going against the grain of dominant conventions and dominant ideals of even liberty equality and fraternity and we do find him celebrating a different kind of uh, uh, revolution a different kind of freedom which uh, bordered on a certain anarchy as well the term byronism itself had come into uh, use to denote the, the spirit of gloom satiety and unrest and in, in a certain way many historians and critics also feel that byron's revolutionary zeal was uh, uh, was something that was focusing more on the destructive side of the revolutionary movement and we do find him moving away from the uh, principles that many of these earlier poets and the earlier thinkers believed in and even among the later uh, poets even among the young revolutionary poets of the later romantic age we do notice that byron was the only one who led such an iconoclastic uh, life throughout his personal and his literary career but however there was a, a flip side to the kind of belief system that he had and uh, some historians are quite right in uh, pointing out that of its utopianism and social aspirations he knows nothing he had no faith in the older order he pours a merciless ridicule upon the spent forces of the ancient feudalism and monarchy but he had no new faith to offer his philosophy ends in blank negation so many are of the opinion that the unrest that he had and also the many ways in which he denounced and rejected the existing uh, principles and the existing system were quite pointless in the end because he did not have any alternative system or any other uh, kind of uh, alternative provision to hold forth 
so it almost becomes a meaningless kind of discourse nevertheless his heroes and his characters continue to fascinate uh, not just the english people but also the uh, readers of world literature to no end his inclinations and his affiliations were quite contrary to what the other major romantic writers believed in and he did not have any proper model or an ideal that he believed in we find him moving away from most of the things that the romantics believed in though he is classified among the romantic poets we do not find him worshiping any of the earlier ideals such as wordsworth or uh, coleridge so it uh, he is uh, even a solitary figure who is taking a very a different revolutionary kind of walk in uh, british romanticism uh, to sum up about byron's uh, influence and the byron's uh, belief system it would suffice to quote from hudson who says he proclaimed himself an adherent of the augustan school admired pope cared little for wordsworth or coleridge and compared the poetry of the 18th century with a greek temple and that of his own time with a barbarous turkish mosque so overall his comparisons may look a little weird and quite out of context especially when we are discussing romanticism but this was precisely the beauty of the uh, romantic movement the beauty of the revolution that came in in the uh, in the in the, in the sphere of uh, literature in britain that it really allowed more room for transgression it also celebrated individuality in whichever way is possible we move on to the next most important figure percy bysshe shelley who lived from 1792 till 1822 he was also a revolutionary idealist but however he was starkly different from that of byron that he had more hope in the world and more to offer to humanity compared to the byron's lost aimless kind of uh, rejection of revolutionary ideas shelley is considered more as a poetic prophet of faith and hope and uh, we also find him going through very turbulent years right from his childhood throughout his educational period he it is reported that he spent some unhappy years at eton he was nicknamed matchley because of the strange things that he believed in and the strange uh, visionary appeal that he had he was also expelled from oxford interestingly and uh, especially for publishing a pamphlet on the necessity of atheism so in shelley we can very rightfully identify the revolutionary and non conformist element in english romanticism he also had a very turbulent uh, uh, life when he approached adulthood his marriage to harriet westbrook it was quite eventful because harriet was still a school girl when shelley married her it also led to an open rupture with his family and uh, uh, this uh, marriage was also not did, also did not last very long his second marriage to uh, mary godwin the daughter of william godwin however proved more fruitful it also led to a lot of intellectual uh, revivalism within him it was after harriet's death that uh, uh, shelley resorted to marrying mary godwin and in 1818 we find him leaving for italy and also by 1822 he came to a, a rather premature ending of his life when he was drowned while sailing across the bay of spezia interestingly all of these uh, romantic writers they met an untimely death and they it said that had they lived their a full life their work would have been quite beyond comparison even in world literature the most successful work of shelley is considered to be prometheus unbound published in 1822 it was a lyrical drama and a readaptation of the old greek myth of prometheus and he also wrote a number of personal poems which were mostly like structure of odes and some of them include the skylark the cloud the sensitive plant the ode to the west wind a lament with a guitar to jane and the indian serenade apart from that he wrote a very significant and a, and a very moving uh, elegy adonis on the death of keats who also died an untimely premature death this uh, the chenchi was a romantic drama on a subject which was really too difficult for treatment within the poetic uh, spheres he was heavily influenced by godwin's political justice and interestingly um, godwin also later becomes his father in law and we do find that most of the writers of those times were heavily influenced by godwin's uh, uh, principles and godwin's uh, philosophical ideas but however uh, in shelley it had a very immediate kind of a reaction leading him uh, to affect leading him to a change not just in his uh, literary uh, productions but also in his overall belief system so uh, as a result we find him condemning all kinds of institutions such as kings governments church property marriage and also all forms of tyranny which are part of these uh, accepted institutions and his religion incidentally was a passion for humanity so we do not find him obeying the conventional rules set in terms of religion or in terms of uh, uh, family or societal relations 
In Queen Mab particularly, the work published in 1813, we find him attacking all kinds of institutional religion and codif codified morality. We also find him rejecting the tenets of Christianity because he found them too tyrannical. In 1817, he published the poem The Revolt of Islam in which he articulates a young poet's hopes for the future regeneration of the world. So, though he was also quite disillusioned with the turn of events which, were, which had happened in the post-revolutionary period, we find him more hopeful about the future which is yet to come. He also had written a number of pamphlets such as Address to the Irish People and The Mask of Anarchy published in 1819 and this was in response to the Peterloo Massacre. It would be useful to again recall that right at the outset, the event that led uh, his expulsion from Oxford was also the composition of a, a pamphlet which questioned religious beliefs and celebrated atheism. England in 1819 was another sonnet by, uh, by Shelley. It closes with a vision of the future revolution of the working classes. In that sense, we find that there is also a political visionary who is within the personality of uh, Shelley. Julian and Madelow, published in 1824, was a very interesting work by Shelley. It is also considered as a central text of English romanticism. It moves away from the predictable uh, kinds of poetry that the romantic poets were otherwise uh, producing. So, it uh, had recreated a naturalistic conversation between Julian and Count Madelo and who were also representatives uh, of uh, Shelley himself and Byron. So, this conversation was quite interesting and it was found uh, quite stimulating and encouraging for the audience of those times. Ozymandias, uh, one of the powerful poems by Shelley is an evocation of wasteland, literary and metaphorically it continues to be much anthologized and taught worldwide as well. In the work The Triumph of Anarchy, we find Shelley analyzing the clash between the general and the particular, between past, present and the future. He also, in that sense, could reflect the anxieties of his time in most of his works. Shelley is quite well known for this uh, masterpiece of uh, work that he produced, The Defense of Poetry, which was also more like a work of literary criticism. It is also useful to remember at this point that from the Romantic period onwards, most of the leading writers also found it uh, their responsibility to talk about the theories of poetry and the theories of literature that they believed in. So, in that sense, this period also lays a foundation to literary criticism in general and it becomes very important when the author himself writes about the poetical uh, productions and also about the uh, various technical and non-technical and the emotional processes that led to the production of particular kinds of writing. This work alongside the other major works of uh, those times such as Lyrical Ballads and Biographia Literaria also become yet another foundational text on which the literary criticism of English literature is built upon. A Defense of Poetry was written in 1821, but it was published only in 1840. It is in this work that he talks about poets as the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And this was also the beginning of the identification of the creative artist as a hero. It would be interesting to read through a certain a very interesting passage from the Defense of Poetry, which also uh, makes clear to us some of the basic tenets in which Shelley believed and also uh, by extension the Romantic uh, period itself believed in. It exceeds all imagination to conceive what would have been the moral condition of the world if a revival of the study of Greek literature had never taken place. If no monuments of ancient sculpture had been handed down to us, and of the poetry of the religion of the ancient world had been extinguished together with its belief. The human mind could never, except by the intervention of these excitements, have been awakened to the invention of the grosser sciences and that application of analytical reasoning to the aberrations of society which is now attempted to exalt over the direct expression of the inventive and creative faculty itself. Here we find Shelley articulating the primary responsibilities of uh, uh, a poet and also the prime importance of poetry over other kinds of arts and or all other kinds of uh, faculty. This is also the time when it was easier for the poets to articulate the primacy of all of these finer arts and uh, the creative faculty over the other more uh, uh, prosaic forms of uh, sciences. Shelley having laid a foundation to many of the tenets of the Romantic uh, times, it was quite easier also for the later critics to take off from many of the principles which were in place. Now we come to the last person, uh, now we come to the last poet uh, who is in our focus. He is the youngest of the lot. He lived only from 1795 to 1821, John Keats. John Keats' life and career could be seen in a remarkable contrast with that of Byron and Shelley. He was neither a rebel nor a utopian dreamer and uh, it is very interesting to note that he was endowed with a purely artistic nature. And his position politically and personally was that of uh, almost complete detachment 
and uh, accordingly it said about him that he knew nothing of Byron's stormy spirit of antagonism to the existing order of things and he had no sympathy with Shelley's humanitarian zeal and passion for reforming the world. He only believed in poetry as the incarnation of beauty and he did not identify poetry as the vehicle of philosophy, religion or even socio-political theories. So as uh, he wrote in one of his poems, End Me On, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. He continued to believe in this uh, throughout his uh, writing career. And he has also stated many times that I have loved the principle of beauty in all things. Some of his important works include End Me On, published in 1818, Lamia, Hyperion, The Eve of Saint Agnes, Isabella, and La Belle Dame Sans Mercy. The fall of Hyperion, written in 1819, was heavily influenced by Milton and we also see him going back to the past in that sense to receive inspiration and also to identify certain, uh, certain important principles of writing. And some of his odes and uh, lyric poems include To Autumn, To a Nightingale and Ode to a Grecian Urn, published in 1819. And in all of these works, we find certain common elements such as the pursuit of eternal truths of poetic art and imagination. And he uh, wrote elsewhere, Beauty is truth and truth is beauty. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. And we find him loving nature just for its own sake and he also celebrates the simple poetry of, of earth keeping in tune with the true spirit of the Romantic period. Keats unfortunately died of consumption much before he completed his 26th birthday. He thus met with a premature death even before his genius ripened into a proper form. Shelley in his most famous elegy on Keats' death remarked about him that he is one of the inheritors of the unfulfilled renown. In terms of the writing style and the form of poetry, Keats is considered as the most romantic of the romantic poets. He also rejected the classic couplets and did not resort to the writing uh, uh, models which were inspired from the 18th century. He also had an immense admiration for the Middle Ages. He was fascinated by Thomas Percy's Relics of Ancient English Poetry published in 1765 and he was also immensely uh, fascinated by the pre-romantic figure of the poet Thomas Chatterton who had met with an untimely death at the age of 15. And we also noted how many of the romantic poets were immensely fascinated by the interesting life and career of uh, Thomas Chatterton. About Keats it said that with him poetry breaks away from the interest of contemporary life returns to the past and devotes itself to the service of beauty. It is for this reason that he seems to stand definitely at the end of his age. Keats is said to have been standing at the end of his age not for just this reason. He also represents the exhaustion of the impulses generated by the social upheaval and the humanitarian enthusiasms of the revolution. As Keats himself wrote in one of his famous letters, do you not see how necessary a world of pains and troubles is to school and intelligence and make it a soul? So this was the kind of influence and the contribution that Keats gave to romantic poetry. And let's uh, wind up our discussion on Keats with this particular poem that he wrote when he was very young. And this also seems to have foreshadowed the events that were to happen in his life considering his premature death. His sonnet title, When I Have Fears That I May Cease To Be, goes like this. When I have fears that I may cease to be, before my pen has gleaned my teeming brain, before high piled books in character, whole like rich garners the full ripened grain, when I behold upon the night's start face huge cloudy symbols of a high romance, and think that I may never live to trace their shadows with the magic hand of chance, and when I feel, fair creature of an hour, that I shall never look upon thee more, never have relish in the fairy power of unreflecting love, then on the shore of the wide world I stand alone and think till love and fame to nothingness do sing. This sonnet was indeed quite prophetic given that he had to leave the earth much before the destined time. And this was also considered as one of the ways in which he could perhaps foresee the events that would happen in his life. Keats, though he lived for a li very little time, wrote quite prolifically and immensely, is also considered as one of the representative poets of the age. Though the most important and the representative figures of the later revolutionary period of the Romanticism include that of Byron, Shelley and Keats, we also have a few other contemporaries who are of notable uh, worth. The other major contemporaries of these poets include James Henry Leigh Hunt, who uh, wrote the story of Rimini in 1816. He also maintained very close relations with Shelley and Keats. The second important one was Thomas or Tom Hood. He was more notable for his humorous writing. He published works such as The Dream of Eugene Aram, The Song of the Shirt, The Bridge of Sides and Fair Inez and The Ode to Melancholy. 
but he spent uh, much of his lifetime, mostly almost uh, uh, 24 years uh, as a hack writer. So that severely had hampered his uh, reputation as a literary writer. The other important figure was Winthrop Macward Praed and he wrote admirable society verses and they were a little popular during his lifetime but they did not really, they were not really considered by the critics and historians at a late point. Richard Harris uh, Barham uh, published uh, an important burlesque known as uh, Ingoldsby Legends. Thomas Lovell uh, Beddoes was uh, best known for The Bride's Tragedy and Death's Jest Book and he was also responsible for the revival of the later Elizabethan drama. It's uh, important to recall that even at this uh, point in the 19th century when romanticism was at its uh, peak, there were many writers such as the Beddoes who were looking back to the Elizabethan age and also trying to recreate the, some of the works from that age. And so in that sense, the romantic age in multiple ways allowed a lot of influences to come in and it's very difficult to say what kind of poetry was more acceptable than the other during the romantic age. Felicia Dorothea Hemmins and Leticia Elizabeth Lanton were two important uh, women writers of this period. But however, it's uh, quite unfortunate to note that uh, most of the historians, most of the conventional historians have not paid adequate attention to them. We shall be coming back at a later uh, session when we talk centrally about the women writers of the Romantic Age to particularly look at the life and works of these uh, two women writers. In fact, the historian Hudson has even marked about Letitia Elizabeth Landon that she had a marked tendency to mere gush. It's also noted in some of the histories that they were both wordy and rather weak and that they possess a rather faint sort of historical interest only. In that sense, many of these women writers were not given adequate attention in the canon or in the uh, literary history. So in one of the later sessions, we shall be talking about the major women writers of this period who did not enjoy much of a canonical status but were quite popular and noted during their own lifetime. So with this observation, we come to the end of today's lecture and we shall come back in the next session to continue looking at some of the other significant aspects of Romantic age and also begin to see how this age uh, began to produce various forms of writings and also encouraged various individualistic tendencies in the literary sphere. Thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session.